Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Zion 2.0. Today my guest is Justin Murphy. Justin, how's it going, man? What's up, man? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. Um, you, okay, so this live stream idea, I actually was very inspired by the work that you've done with live streams. Oh, cool. And I've I've done a few, but I'm still very new at them. Mm. And one thing I noticed in the first, the first stream I did was, and maybe it's the software I'm using, but the first stream I did, there was a huge lag between the, b- between the Zoom video. It was like 20 seconds between the Zoom video and then the YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I had a hard time monitoring the chat. Mm. It was like very divided. Mm. Um, what, 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 like, what are some of your best practices with live streaming? Just, mm. to, well, just to start us off on a sure, logistical yeah. front. Sure. I always used Google Hangouts back in the day, but then they shut that down for live streaming. So now I use StreamYard. I don't know if you've seen it around, no. but um, it's a startup by these two guys. It's pretty much just software for, it's in-browser software for doing live streams. Hmm. And it's pretty much optimized to be as simple and effective as possible for this type of use case. And I think it works really well. I think those two uh, young guys have done a really good job with StreamYard. And so I, I'm happy to recommend it. I'm not an affiliate or anything like that. I think um, that's kind of the place to be at the moment for live streams like this. Cool. And you can monitor, like you can monitor the chat and. Yeah. So it has built in functionality for all of that. So you can see within the, what they call the broadcast studio, you can see the, the chat associated with YouTube. You can stream to multiple destinations if you want to. I've only recently started doing that. That seems uh, a kind of no brainer and just gives you kind of more viewers. And uh, yeah, it seems to all work quite flawlessly. And there's a few other efficiencies built in that are kind of clever. So like you make the event on StreamYard and then it automatically creates the YouTube event. So you don't have to, uh, you know, type in all the information associated with the, the YouTube event. I think for serious content creators, one of the things you learn is that all the, the problem is all the little things, all the tiny little tasks mm-hmm. that you have to do over and over again. Anything that can just kind of consolidate three different micro tasks into one thing and into one task uh, that's, that's tr- worth a tremendous amount. So yeah, I'm like constant, I'm really brutal with trying to kind of automate and optimize as much as possible. And I, so far of everything I've tried StreamYard, uh, seems to be the best way to do a live stream for this type of purpose. Cool. And I imagine that people, people that are tuning in probably have heard of you and know what you're up to, but when I put this up with this to my RSS feed, I'll have a, I'll have a podcast audience who may or may not have heard of you. So, um, I'll, I'll try and do like the, I'll try and introduce you in the way that I understand it. And then you can make any corrections or additions. Sure. Does that sound okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So you were a political scientist and um, you uh, sort of lost faith or got annoyed with a lot of the sort of bureaucratic red tape with the institution and working with academia as a whole. And you have since started this... Um, this project of creating an independent academic life for yourself on the internet. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Sure. That's one way to summarize it quite efficiently, I think. And and what what would you add? What would you fill in the blanks with? Well, what I would add is simply that it's not so conscious and planned out as that. It's more, I found myself kind of forced into this path. So I don't think what I'm doing is that interesting in itself, like I'm no particular genius inventing some totally new thing. That's not how I I see myself, but I see, but, but I do think that what I'm doing is very interesting and important because of what it represents. Mm. I do believe increasingly that what I am carving out for myself gropingly is truly at the frontier of something really important kind of historically. And so that's more and more what I'm really interested in and what I think is important about me and what I'm doing. It's not so much any particular Mm -hmm. stroke of genius that I've had. Pretty much the only thing I would add to your story is that I bought into this idea in academia, which is a very widespread myth that if you pay your dues and you work hard and you climb the ranks, that once you get tenure, then you have this kind of unique perch of, of intellectual freedom. You have a good paycheck coming in. You can then kind of research whatever you want. You're not so vulnerable to the, to the competitive career demands. Once you have tenure, you have a good paycheck and you can basically explore whatever you want. You can speak freely and, and you're, you're safe to do so. That was the only reason I ever got into academia was on that promise, on, on that hope. Um, 
you know, I've always had a kind of radical inclination to provocative speech. And I've always, my mind has always been wanting to go to what's hidden and what's, you know, dangerous and not allowed. And that's just like intrinsically where my mind goes. I find it interesting and, and, and motivating. Why, why, why do you think that is? Well, I don't like? know. That's probably just the constitutional personality thing of mine. But in, mm -hmm. the reason I mention it is just because that's the only reason I ever even got into academia was, was because of the dream that once I truly proved myself and got tenure, then I would finally be free. And I could really go to town for the rest of my life in a, in a kind of radical intellectual uh, project. And by radical, I just mean kind of honest, really, truly independent. And so once it became clear that that wasn't a reality, that then I had to start reevaluating. And pretty much what happened was I was doing really well, pretty much. Like I had made it. I had really finally made it. I got the British version of tenure. This was in Britain. I was a professor in Britain. And I got the British version of tenure. I had very prestigious publications. I, I had finally truly arrived as a kind of established and not just established, but successful, like publishing and, you know, like top, like top journals in my field. So that was when I started to start take my liberties. You know, I started to be more creative and I started to be more provocative in the things I, and saying the things I actually thought and felt. And because I thought that was the whole idea. I thought that was the whole bargain of academia. And so right as I was uh, doing that, it was just increasingly clear that it was that this like mythical dream of like of intellectual freedom after tenure is a total myth because as I started taking more liberties, I started getting flack from my administrators, even though I was, I was doing everything really well. And I was actually like pretty elite. I was pretty elite political scientist. Like uh, not, I don't want to hype myself up too much. I'm def definitely no like Steven Pinker or anything like that. But uh, I was like do it publishing really well and, and, and everything. And that didn't get me any, any power to, to, to speak freely or to be more creative so then what happened was my internet stuff was kind of doing better and better. My patrons were increasing, my subscribers, like all the key metrics of kind of internet power, all of those things were increasing at the same time that my uh, kind of model, my mental model of what academia is actually was kind of decreasing in its attractiveness. And so those two things kind of intersected, the increasing attractiveness and power that I was having on the internet and the decreasing attractiveness and power that I felt I had in academia and right as those two things were intersecting, I, a student, um, the, the, str the, the straw that broke the camel's back was a student did not like that I used the word retard occasionally on Twitter. And they complained to my dean and I got suspended and I got, I got put on paid leave. So it was actually pretty dope. But they, were, they told me, they were like, okay, just don't talk about this. We just need to do an investigation. You know, if you don't talk about this, um, maybe it'll all blow over was the kind of the impression I got. And I was like, that, that's when I knew that I had crossed the Rubicon. That's when I knew there was no going back because when my dean suspended me on, on paid leave and she told me, you're not allowed to talk about anything related to this, I knew right then that was not no longer an option. Like I talk about everything. I'm not going to not talk about something because of that kind of conditionality. So I knew that was, I knew that was the beginning of the end and I would probably be leaving academia from there. So uh, I don't know if I'm going into too much detail for you, but that's pretty much the story. No, that's great. Um, I do have a question though about... Uh, um, can you think of examples of, um, things that ruffled feathers other than just like saying retard on Twitter? Cause like you said that the, the academic myth burst like pretty early on, like, like what's an idea, what's an example of like a, a dangerous idea or something that ruffles feathers in an academic setting? Like, and maybe yeah, you can use yeah. a personal example here if you yeah, remember. Sure. I'll give you a, one good example. This was probably one of the first foreshadowings I had of perhaps my 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 intellectual life would no, no longer be consistent with academia is honest public talk about recreational drug use for instance mm -hmm. uh I, the the university or the academy is i think uh kind of ridiculously stupid on this front so for instance i got some flack uh, a couple of years ago when i i posted video to my instagram of me tripping on mushrooms in amsterdam with my wife and it was just me and my wife in a hotel room in Amsterdam, uh, tripping on mushrooms. I made some silly videos, like talking while I was tripping and they were really beautiful. They were, I, I really feel strongly that they were just beautiful, interesting, funny video artifacts of a lovely time I was having with my wife that was in every way, perfectly healthy and beautiful and, and 
And and in Amsterdam, I mean, you know, it's not even really illegal. It's it's a kind of gray zone, but it's well known, obviously, for being uh, permissive. So technically, I, I mean, arguably, I wasn't even breaking any laws. So um, as far as I could see, I did absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever. There was nothing there that I uh, felt any shame about or would apologize for or take back. But I did get some uh, early flack. That was the first thing I did where I started getting flack, uh, pretty much like people above me telling me like, Justin, you really can't do that. And so that's just one example, right? It's nothing very impressive or genius. Like I'm not, uh, you know, when I say dangerous ideas or radical truth seeking or these different phrases I use, I'm rarely actually referring to anything particularly profound. It's more the principle of being real and being honest and uh, freely and aggressively exploring all of the different subspaces of, of human experience. I mean, I'm a social scientist. I, I almost think I'm obligated to, uh, if I'm trying different uh, drugs, I'm, I'm almost obligated to report on what they feel like, what effects they have, uh, what I think about them. Mm -hmm. I feel like these are obligations of a public intellectual. And it's just one example of how being an academic today, you're, it's like you're not really allowed or able, let alone empowered, to explore all of the trains that are actually most interesting and important right now. Do academics think you're crazy? Like, have you had, like, I'm curious about the feedback you get from people that are still in academia and they see what you're doing. Um, I'm curious, like, what, what sorts of comments or questions have you gotten from people that are still in that institutional setting? I guess I get a few different responses. Some people think I'm crazy. I think some people, to be perfectly honest, are pretty envious, to be honest, um, mm -hmm. because I, and, and, oh, and by the way, I, I definitely also get a lot of just straight up support. Like I get emails uh, and messages from professors who just say that they love what I'm doing and they're really inspired by it. And they're glad that someone is taking these types of risks to to create kind of alternative spaces outside of academia that are still kind of academically sophisticated, essentially. And yeah, so it's, it's a mixed bag, as you would expect. I think often, uh, to be honest, something I didn't expect is that when I talk with people who are currently academics, especially if they're not superstars and, you know, most people aren't, aren't superstars. I actually get a feeling that they are sad and often quite unhappy. I think there's a lot of unhappiness in academia. And when I tell them about what I'm doing and I have my kind of characteristic, like positivity and, and enthusiasm, I think they just kind of feel sad that they, that they don't have that, to be honest. Mm. I've, I've, I've observed that a lot, I think. Mm. So you you're working on this new, it's like a membership community, Indie Thinkers. Yeah, it's a so, private membership community. It's called IndieThinkers.org, and the logic behind it is pretty much just to get as many people as I can who are doing serious long-term intellectual work on the internet, and get them all together. And first of all, teach them everything I know simply because I've been doing this a little bit longer than a lot of other people have. I, I see myself essentially as kind of out, far out on this kind of new type of niche that hasn't even really been fully understood or articulated for itself. There's not really a kind of self-consciousness around this niche, but there, but it exists. It's, it's forming. And, and the way I think about it essentially is it's like the content creator niche, which is obviously a much larger niche, but a specific kind of subdivision in which people are doing highbrow work that is simply more sophisticated than what most people are consuming, essentially. And I don't mean that in a pretentious way, like, oh, we're, we're smarter than other people. But by high, I like the word highbrow just because I feel, I feel like it conveys, it's not that it's like more genius or something like that. It's just like more nerdy kind of philosophy, science types of highly educated, um, longer term goals really of, of figuring out scientific puzzles or constituting long-term kind of artistic accomplishments rather than just like making YouTube videos or, or making money on Patreon. Uh, what's defining about what I call the independent intellectual or the indie thinker for short is that we're essentially pursuing traditional artistic or scientific or philosophical goals over a long-term time span at a highbrow level uh, but we're trying to figure out how to do it without any institutions and in a in a self-sustainable, self-financing way. And mm -hmm. I've been doing I've been kind of iterating on this myself from my own model for like two years now because I, it was probably a long time ago that I kind of had 
my first impressions that academia and I were eventually not going to get along. So I've really been like slowly building up everything I've been doing for probably like well more than two years, in, in other words. And I, I've been iterating and everything I do, I do it with a very kind of strategic kind of framework in my operations, in other words. And so I feel like I have a lot, I've learned a lot and I have some pretty, pretty sophisticated kind of frameworks and, and systems that um, as I meet more and more people who are coming to me, kind of asking me questions about how I do things and expressing interest in doing something similar, it became clear to me that I'm kind of just finding myself accidentally at the epicenter of this new type of niche of independent intellectuals. And I do have a lot to share. So I decided to pretty much uh, do this on a kind of startup model, just a small, modest kind of bootstrap startup, no outside funding or anything like that. But basically I decided I would put in a lot of work, kind of organizing work to get all these people together to the best of my ability. And one, teach them everything I know, but two, uh, kind of facilitate and invest in the community di dynamics to allow them to kind of multiply their own forces essentially. And mm. so I'm sl only slowly rolling that out right now. It's in private beta. I'm not really hyping it up at the moment not going very hard on it because I'm trying to get the processes and workflows down. I want to get the community really humming with a lot of value before I really start, you know, publicizing it or whatever, but that is underway now. And it's one of my main focuses at the moment. Mm. So the long-term vision with that community, do you see it more as kind of like a training ground for people that want to be um, independent um, broadcasters in a sense, or do you also see potential for, uh, collaboration, the people's ideas synergizing and um, sort of creating more of a uh, like cooperative type structure. Yeah, I definitely see it as a platform for uh, collaboration and and learning and kind of uh, mutually beneficial uh, kind of productive processes essentially is, is what I'm trying to put together. So one of the things I do is when people join the community, I kind of get a profile of them, of their strengths and weaknesses, and then I'm able to match them with other people who have a complementary, you know, a different, a, but complementary strengths and weaknesses. So it's like the basic logic is there are lots of people who are, who are like trying to do some sort of interesting intellectual project, but they're just by themselves. And maybe they're, they happen to have a background in audio engineering. So editing their podcast is really easy for them and they're good at it. They're, they find it fun and that's no problem for them. But on the other hand, um, maybe they're not so good with writing. So they want to write blog posts or, or something like this. That's a part of what they want to do, but that's, they're, they're really slow with that. They find it painful and they're not very good at it. Well, there might be someone else in the community with the exact opposite profile. So you can imagine uh, this community of indie thinkers basically being a kind of generating skill shares or even labor exchanges where people essentially are able to delegate to each other that which they're not good at to people who are better at it. That, kind, mm -hmm. that type of, that's just one example of the type of kind of community uh, multiplication of forces that that I that I'm trying to build. Hmm. And I've seen you talk a little bit about um, uh, like role role playing online, like having a, a particular persona uh, that is a mask of some sort. It, hmm. Like imagine the internet like a like a, a stage, and it's a theater, and you're playing this part. Um, and what made me think about this is you said in the context of the work you're doing, you use the word highbrow. But some of the shit you say on Twitter is like kind of more of an edgelord aesthetic, which right. is confusing, but I think that's the point, right? Mm. Is mm. that the point? Well, okay, there's a lot going on there. Let's, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll start at a high level, but feel free to, <laughs> feel free to, feel free to um, poke at this or, or ask any of those other follow-up questions. You asked about, kind of playing a character. And the way that I've always seen this, this has been a kind of abiding philosophy of my own, of my whole life, to be honest. I did this in grad school also all the time. The way that I think about it is radical intellectuals should always be themselves to an extreme degree. It's the, it's the being profoundly honest about oneself that is the source of the greatest insights and also kind of the most explosive and, and kind of socially valuable insights because for the most part, modern bourgeois society, what defines it is the split between the public and the private. So most people kind of interacting in the public sphere, public intellectuals, most of them are, they're presenting a highly polished version of themselves, which is essentially hiding all of the, the rotten stuff, all of the nasty stuff, all of the ugly stuff. But those are parts of reality. That's part that's part and parcel of, of, of that which exists. And if the the goal of the radical intellectual is to explain and describe and put forward 
that which other people, that which is real and true, but which other people are afraid to put forward, well, then it, it's very obvious that all of the kind of introspective personal data that we know about our own horrors and our own imperfections and our own fears and anxieties and and our tendencies to deceive each other, all of the kinds of uh, things that, that we know we do and we're constantly battling with ourselves on, like that is all to me the kind of most important terrain of insights that are likely to be really explosive in terms of like truth proliferation, uh, but also in terms of kind of uh, functioning as like grenades on the reigning order of lies and and injustice. I mean, I ultimately do believe in a deep way that all of the kind of injustice that exists in the world is essentially predicated at some point in the process on lies or errors or mistakes. And so the more like truth bombs you can throw into the world, the more uh, kind of radical pieces of insight, the more you're essentially chipping away at uh, kind of injustice in, in one way or another. And so I think the way you do that, the the most efficient and easy and powerful way to do that is to just start with all the things you think and feel that you do really think and feel that other people are afraid to tell the world about because it looks bad essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's like the key initial vast reservoir of material for the radical intellectual. And it works in a very systematic process. Like when you do this, people hate it. They're supposed to hate it. That's always been true from Socrates to Diogenes to Jesus to Rousseau to, uh, you know, to, to, to myself. And yes, I do see myself in that line. Thank you very much. I do not think <laughs> I am Jesus, but I do imitate but Diogenes you're, and Socrates but you're and, and Jesus, Jesus adjacent. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's what Christians do, right? The whole idea is to imitate Christ. I do not think I'm the second coming. I don't think I'm Socrates or Diogenes either, but I do see myself in this tradition. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm not I'm not afraid to say that whatsoever. I do think that's what radical intellectuals do. They're almost gener they have to be hated uh, almost by definition in some sense. And um, right. So where I was going with that is just to also say that I started off by saying that I think radical intellectuals have to radically be themselves, but it's paradoxical how to be yourself. How to be yourself is a very difficult thing to, to parse, right? Because you don't really know who yourself is until you're performing it, right? So it's like to the paradox is to really be yourself, to be radically honest and to be nothing but who you truly are to the maximum. You actually have to put in a lot of effort and creativity to play the character that you want to be. So the character that you want to be, the character that you aspire to be is the truest representation of who you actually really are. Because if your values and your desires and that vision of what life should be, that vision of what a, a, in, what, of what an ideal individual looks like and sounds like, that vision of what that ideal individual is, is the truest index of what you really are because it's it reflects what you, what you believe should be, right? That's a more accurate and important kind of index of, of who I am as a, as a person and as a character. But that ideal vision of what a human should be is emphatically not who I am on a daily basis. On a daily basis, I'm, I'm crappy. I'm stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm not half the man I want to be. I'm not half the man that I could be. And I know that. So who I am in practice, in a, in a kind of actualized way, to use the Deleuzian term, for instance, who I am actually, in terms of the raw data of what I have done in my life and what I have not done in my life uh, up until this very moment right now, that raw data of the actualized Justin Murphy is a, 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 an artificial in shell of, of who I truly am. Mm. The actual is not the real. The virtual is the real. That's, that's, a, that's an essential to losing insight. So the person that I want to be, the person I believe I should be, that I aspire to be, that's the virtual Justin. And in a Deleuzean register, we would say that's the more true Justin. That's the more real Justin. And so the only way that you can actually bring into fruition your true self, who you really are, is to perform consciously like you're a character, the person that you want to be. So yeah, that's that's the way that I say it. And I think that's hard for people to understand because it essentially means to be yourself, you have to kind of pretend that you are the person you dream of being. Mm -hmm. And so that that's why people often think I'm like a bullshitter or I'm faking or like I'm just being ironic or that I'm like, people have all these kind of confused ideas about me. Um, and I think that's, I think this is essentially why, because they don't realize that, yes, I am pretending and, and I'm pretending to be the person I want to be. I'm trying, I'm trying to play a character that I believe in, but that is my true self the, to play that character. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think people just don't understand that. So they get confused by it. And what role do, um, 
what, what role do other people play? And I'm thinking specifically, I'm thinking specifically of like this idea that we are, you know, we're not these like individual units that are operating in a vacuum. It's like mm. we could, we are composed of the web of relationships that we're a part of. And so, it, so, um, mm-hmm. you know, we get feedback back from people. And mm-hmm. so it, it, to me, what hearing what you're saying, it seems like what one needs to do is tune who you listen to feedback from, like mm-hmm. who the feed, who, wh- which people's feedback is important and what people just sort of need to be tuned out. And, and they're not sort of useful for, for updating this sort of virtual self. Does, does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I got you. And I think that's a really important point or, or terrain of research that needs to be optimized for any type of real honest intellectual today. You have to, you have to think this through. And I mean, I, my answer to that question, I, I, I have thought this through for myself anyway, is that the ideal situation is you really like a, a true intellectual really only needs or wants maybe like three friends, like true friends in real life. And then uh, not counting family, obviously is family, family's uh, its own, its own sphere. And I think you should prioritize having, having good family relations that are uh, unconditional on politics and things like that. Uh, but apart from family and maybe like, you know, three people that you uh, stay in touch with all the time throughout life and, and uh, care about deeply over long periods of time. You only really need a few of those is what I'm getting at. And those are true friends, but other than true friends, uh, you should, I think like honest intellectuals have to be pretty rigorous with not caring about like the whole other mass of people for the most part, the way that I think. So the, so the way that I think about it is like all the people on the internet, like everyone on the internet means not like none of them mean anything to me. And I think you have to cultivate that. Like, I don't give a fuck what some random Twitter person thinks, even if they're like famous, even if they're like a journalist or whatever, like they're they're They don't exist to me. They're not real. They're, they're, they're just a uh, simulacrum essentially. And however, however, in the process of trying to pursue a radical intellectual career on the internet, you're going to alienate most people. Most people are going to not like what you or not understand you or make fun of you or think you're bad or something, whatever. Uh, but there are also going to emerge into your orbit, people who get immediately what you're doing and like it. And they want to be, they want to talk, they want to collaborate. And um, so in other words, what I'm getting at is the the radical intellectual life that I have developed and that I kind of teach others to, to pursue, I guess, has a very powerful built-in sorting mechanism, essentially. You know, it alienates almost everyone, but then it also brings into your email inbox, like a few, anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred people who immediately know exactly, pretty much get what you're doing and they like it and they're trying to do something similar and they want to uh, find ways to collaborate. And the, and those are always going to be like highly, uh, highly, th- there's a high probability that those are people that are worth working with and worth talking with and potentially becoming good friends with, they could potentially, you know, enter that kind of smaller sphere of, of true good friends. But, um, that's pretty much the way I see it is like, I say whatever I want, I do whatever I want. If it pisses people off, then I say, fuck you. And, uh, to the people that who like it, I just talk with them. <laughs> so, so this idea of like, not, not giving a shit what anyone on the internet thinks. So imagine there's this, like, there's this hypothetical person who, really likes what you're doing and decides to give you a bunch of money. And at first it seems like there's no strings attached, right? Mm-hmm. They're just like being a, a ben, uh, you know, uh, a generous donor. Um, but let's say this person starts to, and you get used to that, right? You're like, Oh man, fuck. Like finally I can start saving for this family that I really want to have. And then slowly they start to, um, be like a like a little voice on your shoulder sort of like whispering and wanting to sort of change the direction of things that you're doing like maybe they don't like a certain thing that you say okay. they're like don't, don't they're like justin do not say retard anymore for fuck's sake do not say retard anymore yeah. like um how do you like it, in your sort of philosophy that you've laid out how would you handle this hypothetical situation for me personally, I, I, not, I don't necessarily think other people have to do this at all, but I, but for me personally, I, w- I wouldn't be able to tolerate that. I would just basically cease the, I would cease the, the funding relationship probably because the, the thing that I'm describing, the model of radical intellectual life that I've kind of traced from Socrates to Diogenes up to Rousseau and uh, all, all the way up to, to today is 
it's really an all or nothing affair. This is something that's really become very clear to me. It's an absolute qualitative commitment that you're either in or you're not. And so like the, 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 the trajectory that I, I have entered onto, which is probably, I don't know, for me, it feels like irreversible. Like I'll never come back from this. There's no way I could come back from this is like, I simply have become constitutionally incapable of, 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 of changing my vocabulary for any type of external request. It's like, I can't do it essentially. So if I tried, I would probably fail. Um, or if I succeed, if I was able to actually suppress my kind of like free running nature, uh, I would suffer so much that I, I would have to cease the, the, the relationship that, but I don't think any of everyone else has to be like that. Like, I don't think, I don't think at any moment in time or place there will ever be more than like 0.05% of the population who are trying to do something like I'm trying to do. I think what I'm trying to do is very weird and unique. I, I'm not necessarily like telling other podcasters or bloggers or whatever that they all should be doing this. Um, although I would like that, I think the society would be much better off, but, um, but for me that I, I've, I don't know, that's, but I don't know. But then again, maybe I'm, maybe who knows Wait, what, would it, would it be better off if more people are doing this? I think so. Like, because as, as I said, my model of the world is that all, all injustice and oppression is essentially predicated on some lie or mistake or error lower down in the system. And in my mental model, in a social scientific way, if we all kind of radically exposed every truth from every nook and cranny that pretty much all injustice and oppression would, uh, would, would, would find itself without foundation and essentially dissipate. I think I agree, but there's like a, there's, there's a second part to it that I think I want to emphasize. Please. There's the, there's the truth telling component and then there's the knowing yourself component. Mm -hmm. So you can be telling the truth. You can be telling it like it is from like a, from like a, totally stunted developmental place. Yeah. You could be, you know, you could be like acting out trauma from your childhood and not yeah. know it at all. So right. there, it seems to be that there it seems to me that there needs to be some sort of mechanism for like deep self knowing and self inquiry and, and, and growth. Like how do I actually be this person that I know that I can be? And that work requires real work. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's an yeah. easy thing to do. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So I'm definitely not calling for a kind of anything goes crazed expression kind of thing. This is what I was saying before about how being your true self is actually produce. You have to produce a very cultivated, focused, disciplined kind of creative projection in some sense. Um, so I think like someone kind of acting, acting out their trauma, their childhood trauma in some sort of um, way that they don't understand. That's kind of uh, not really transparent that 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 would not be that's not a kind of that's not a truth process that's quite the opposite that's not a kind of unconcealing or or revealing of that which is there but it's precisely the opposite it's like if, if you're like causing all types of damage in other people's lives and relationships because you're like saying things that you think and feel in some kind of like really aggressive violent way or something like that disruptive way um the that would be an example of someone who's not uh, kind of revealing truth, but is kind of hysterically uh, acting out or lashing out precisely because of something that is uh, misunderstood to them. Mm. So, so yeah, for sure. It's a difficult, it's a delicate thing for sure. And uh, the kind of radical truth seeking that I'm interested in has tons of failure modes uh, and, and it can go wrong in, in tons of ways. Yeah, for sure. Mm. What are some of those other failure modes? Oh, well, um, losing all your friends and family, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. like I've had to, I've had to figure this out over time. Um, it's one of the many like obscure things that I have a lot of experience on that. Like most people would never think is, is a kind of, uh, I don't know, like aspect of, of, of strategic or, or tactical insight on how to do intellectual work. But like, yeah, when you go viral on the internet for something that for like something bad going viral in the negative way, uh, it presents like real political pressure on your on your family essentially and mm -hmm. and that's like a real pitfall that's something really to to handle and um i've personally come to the per i come to the personal conclusion that i am i do compromise my radical truth seeking i compromise with the with the people that uh i consider to be in my inner circle of my real life uh friends and family essentially so like the small number of true friends i talk to you about 
plus family, I actually do reserve to them a special kind of political privilege in my life such that I will, if they really don't want me to use one particular word, I can try to not do that and I'll do that happily because I do have this kind of traditionalist investment in the actual people around you being essentially a part of your your organism, essentially. Like I, I'm deeply invested in my wife. I'm deeply invested in my true friends and family and their their happiness and well-being is my own, essentially. And so I don't see that as a compromise, in other words. So the example you gave mm -hmm. me of like, if I have if I was receiving funds from someone and they really didn't want me to use the, re, the word retard, I would be incapable of making that compromise personally. But if like my wife is truly unhappy and uncomfortable on a daily basis about me saying or doing something specific, I'm happy to say, okay, I won't do that thing because mm -hmm. she's, she's, she's my other half. She's my heart and soul, you know? Mm -hmm. Nice. What role does, um, what role does religion play in your life? It plays a major role, I think. However, I'm not, a very good religious person. I mean, I, I, I'm, this is something also, I think like people are very confused about my, in my work. And I get a lot of flack for from like more properly religious people is like, I, I've never pretended to be a good Catholic. I'm not, I'm, I'm really not, but I, but I do believe I, I think, I think it's true. I think Catholicism is a, an, an extraordinary and beautiful system that reflects the truth essentially. And so I think Catholicism is true. I believe in it. And I, and I, and I pledge allegiance to it in that regard. Uh, in my everyday life, I'm, I'm, you know, very fallen heathen creature, <laughs> but, um, but, but I do, I do consider myself kind of uh, obligated to that ethical system. I do believe it's true. I do. And I do try to hold myself accountable to it. And so I do think it, it actually structures a lot of my ideas in a lot of ways. I think if you, if you look into my political ideas and kind of the stuff that I've written, uh, I, th I think, I think it's easy to see a very strongly kind of Catholic orientation, but I'm not especially well schooled in it. I don't pretend to be a theologian. I'm not, and I'm, and I certainly don't pretend to be a particularly upright um, or you know impressive Catholic in in any regard. But I would say it has it has strong effects on how I see things. I'm just not uh, as good at it as I would like to be. Hmm. Are there um, are there personal practices or like a, um, aspects of Catholicism that are part of the um, the like self-reflective truth telling mechanism and like, like what, what would be an example of that? Absolutely. I think the most obvious one would be the confession. Mm. So essentially the model of public intellectual activity that I believe in is essentially a kind of public confessional. So if you look at someone like Rousseau, for instance, Rousseau essentially invented the modern genre of the autobiography with his book, The Confessions. And his book, The Confessions, is pretty much him trying to tell everything in his entire life, like everything he's done wrong, pretty much. Where he tries to pretty much like paint a portrait of himself, but it was kind of infamous at the time. And what was special about it at the time was that he went deep into his shortcomings and things he did wrong. And, you know, uh, his, his, his various, you know, quite kind of pathetic or disturbing, sometimes scandalous, uh, kind of fallen sinful nature over time. And I think what he believed was that this is the, this is one of the obligations or the tasks of, of a radical public intellectual. And if there are at least some people who can, who can, who can do that type of hard work on themselves in a public way, it, I, I think he really did believe that it essentially what I said before that, that, that has long-term positive effects in terms of, uh, you know, pretty much like cutting the ground out from underneath injustice and oppression. And so that's essentially a secular kind of version of, of the Catholic confessional. And yeah, I think, I think we're all, I think we're sinners and I think we should, we should like own up to that and be, be super aware of that. And so I think going into the confessional on Saturdays to tell a priest, you know, all the fucked up things I thought and did uh, the, the week before is a, a very well aligned with the kind of model of public intellectual life that I'm, I'm going for. So mm. like, for instance, like I, I've gotten in a lot of trouble in the past few months for, for tweeting about pedophilia, like pedophilia is just one of many kind of social issues that is so loaded with different types of hypocrisies and confusions 
and that if you if you if you try to talk about pedophilia in any type of way that's other than just kind of simple moralizing pedophilia is bad if you try to basically say anything outside of moralizing pedophilia is bad you get pegged as a pedo and you'll have people on twitter calling you pedo and all this shit and um but in a way that's a like i have like i've never had any problems with that i have no personal relationship to, to pedophilia in any way whatsoever um but like talking about it in some way is in a way that's not moralizing is at least it's like saying we all could possibly find ourselves um subject to the to these to these hideous drives that are distributed throughout the population these hideous drives that exist throughout the population they exist uh, it, it is it is one small fraction of the wildly diverse uh kind of human experience and uh by simply talking about it it's it's almost as if i'm like doing a kind of uh confessional work right that other people aren't able to do because i i'm the one who gets punished for it right almost as if i am the pedophile right so it's like the public intellectual in some ways um substitutes themselves for the uh the the other kind of stigma stig stigmatized groups in society right it's mm. like the public intellectual makes himself stigmatized in the place of um stigmatized groups are who aren't able to kind of intellectually describe what's really going on mm. what what needs to be said about pedophilia that's not being said Oh, well, I would say more generally the child, the child today is the site of many overlapping contradictions that mm -hmm. is, as soon as you look under the hood, it's just an explosive can of worms. Um, and that's why our society kind of has this uh, consensus to just not look under the hood, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that was like my whole, that was the whole point of that, that tweet that got me in a lot of trouble. Uh, that was probably like the most viral I've ever been was the tweet about uh, Jeffrey Epstein and, and Greta Thunberg. The point, the whole point there um, is that our society really wants to think of children as this fountain of pure, innocent insight into the world. And then we also want to think of them as uh, unable to make their own decisions when it comes to things like sex, right? And so um, this is, that's just one example, right? You can't, mm -hmm. you, you can't really say that a 16 year old brain is capable of diagnosing complex global political problems and providing advice to uh, to global political leaders on how to handle complex issues. You cannot believe that a 16 year old female brain is capable of that type of intellectual and political maturity, that she's so deserving of that kind of attention and even, even allegiance from global political leaders, and then also say that a 16 year old female brain cannot consciously decide to have sex with someone in full mature consent. You mm -hmm. just can't have those two things at once, but our society sure wants to. And uh, there's pretty much like no constituency who wants to hear about these types of um, contradictions or tensions, but that is the role of the radical intellectual to find the tensions and contradictions that essentially have no constituency. But if you speak them, if you speak them honestly and you just prod them, uh, there will be at least, and this is what's beautiful about the internet, there is at least a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the people out there who are genuinely interested in just exploring like radical, provocative, dangerous tensions and truths and, and, and puzzles and questions. So that's what the internet allows us to do is like radical intellectuals on the Diogenes Rousseau Jesus model can find just enough of a small audience on the internet to essentially fund them. So mm. that's that's the that's the new zone that I think we're in. It's actually becoming possible to to, to till these like explosively these explosively provocative terrains that pretty much have no constituency for analyzing or, or figuring out. It's now becoming minimally possible to fund that type of uh, intellectual uh, exploration because of uh, what the internet enables now. Mm. Okay, so we got a question in the chat. Kenny Rowe is asking, is there a difference in the kind of rigorous work you're doing in an independent setting as opposed to an academic setting? Is there a difference in method in each environment? Oh yeah, huge, huge, huge. I mean, what people don't understand about academia is that most of the work you do intellectually is extremely subordinated to instrumental concerns, essentially. I mean, you have to publish in journals 
Uh, but you don't just have to publish in journals. You have to publish in the best journals you can. And to publish in the best journals you can, that means you have to publish on pretty much the most significant findings that you are capable of discovering, which means you pretty much have to stay as close as possible to whatever you did your PhD on. Um, and so these, these are just like, so I just riffed for you basically like five different kind of instrumental external uh, pressures or or constraints on like what exactly you're trying to optimize for. And so, and you have to do this because if you don't do it, you don't advance in your career. And if you don't advance in your career, then you don't have the time and money to do the research itself. Um, so for, and for what it's worth, I mean, the average academic doesn't even have that much money to, or time or space to do research. Most of, for the average academic or the median academic in this regard, most of their time and labor is actually given to bureaucracy, teaching classes, marking papers, having student meetings, office hours, and then a whole bunch of other kind of random bureaucratic tasks that fall into the lap of academics today. So if you want to have the grants and the funding and the time and space to even do research, you have to be radically subordinated to instrumental pol political games, essentially publishing in the right journals, which means having the right topics, which means using the right methods. It's it's so, so the actual creative intellectual activity is almost completely carved out. The exception would be if you're like in the top, you know, 1% of performers, right? If you're like extremely intelligent, high IQ, and also extremely conscientious, then I think that's the type of person who can both succeed in the academic competitive game and also do some interesting creative stuff on the side. Um, someone like, I think Tyler Cowen would be a really good example of this, um, but but he's a freak of nature, right? And 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 to his credit, uh, that all, all, all the great, you know, that, that's great for him, but um, for the overwhelming majority of people who are interested in doing intellectual work, even really smart people, even really productive people, but not quite in the top 1% of these things, you're just, all of your academic time and effort is going to be subordinated to optimizing for essentially non-intellectual criteria just to stay afloat essentially. And that was what I discovered. Like I, I did well in academia. I played that game and I did well. I, I published in some top journals. I made it uh, as a political scientist, but it was patently clear to me that to hold that game, to keep playing that game and to hold that career and, and stay at that level of, of intellectual kind of academic publishing success, I would never be allowed to think a weird, fun, creative, interesting thought like ever. Like, of course I could on the weekends, but I wouldn't have any time to dedicate to developing them or doing anything fun or interesting or weird like ever. It, it was mm. that patently clear to me. And I was just like, this isn't worth it. It's just not worth it for, for, for me. And I, I suspect um, that I'm, you know, uh, put it this way, I, like I'm, I'm unique and you can't generalize, you know, you know, completely from me, but you can generalize from me much more than you can generalize from the small number of academics who are doing successful academic careers and also fun, interesting, creative stuff online. Like someone like Ty Tyler Cowen is much more of a statistical freak than I am. Like I'm much more, I'm more of a normal person. I'm not that, I'm not as smart as Tyler Cowen. I'm not as uh, conscientious as Tyler Cowen. I'm not able to churn out the type of work that he, that he has on that kind of level. And then also write a blog every fucking day. Um, I, I'm not blessed that way. Um, so where I'm going with this is that, yeah, the intellectual game is completely different. And a lot of this is personality based. So like I'm very high, though I'm not super high IQ and I'm not super high conscientiousness. What I'm actually super high on is aspect enthusiasm, which is one half of um, the extroversion trait on the big five. Um, and so I think that I'm, I decided that I'm able to, with my traits and my personality type, I'm able to thrive on the internet in a way that I'm not able to thrive on, on, on in academia in, in the sense that what, what, the internet game really selects for is um, high volume, high energy, high consistency, people being able to like be we like being weird is rewarded on the internet, essentially being kind of wacky, being a little loose, being a little imprecise, being a little imperfect. Like if you're pretty smart, like I am and pretty conscientious, like I am, but you're also kind of weird and imperfect in many ways. Um, that's actually the internet is the best place to do intellectual work because you can still do long-term projects. You can do long form blog posts and serious data analyses and testing scientific hypotheses. Like I'm still doing uh, what I consider to be quite sophisticated academic work. That's of the same intellectual quality as the work that I was doing in, in academic journals, publishing in acad academic journals. I'm just doing it in a different, it has a different tempo. It has a different pacing. It's broken down into different content units. 
Um, and it has obviously a totally different kind of vibe and tone and flavor, but it, but I'm still essentially a social scientist. I'm still essentially trying to develop uh, accurate theories about how the world works and I'm testing them, but I'm, I'm testing them uh, in practice by developing systems and uh, starting businesses and uh, writing long form blog posts and, and self publishing books or whatever. So yeah, I think it's obviously a different, it's a totally different game. It has a totally different vibe, feels different. It selects and, and for different traits and, and rewards different traits. Um, but uh, essentially it's all about truth seeking and, mm. and, and being as honest and rigorous and objective as possible. But in academia, it's this highly kind of instrumentalized pressurized system. Whereas in, on the internet, it's this, uh, crazy wide open, uh, kind of creative, uh, frontier land. Mm. So how, how far have you strayed from your, your dissertation? Like, like if you think about like the questions you were asking when you wrote it versus the questions that are most top of mind now, like what, what, what shift has, has taken place, would you say? Oh, for my dissertation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm light years away from my dissertation because again, my dissertation, it, like what people don't understand is when you, when you're in a PhD program and it comes time to decide what you're going to do your dissertation on. If you want to pursue an academic career in academia, you want to succeed in that way and get tenure and all of that, pretty much what, you, what you're interested in doesn't matter. You can't really care about what you're interested in. The only questions that matter are, what is my best chance at getting into a prestigious journal in my field as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. And then from there, the, the, the intermediate criteria that in, implies is the following what is the most sophisticated methodology that I'm, that my IQ is like mentally capable of, of, of learning and conducting that has the highest kind of cultural capital in my field. Um, and then what is the, what is just the best idea that I can find best in the sense of um, having some sort of impact in the arcane debates that the field is interested in. It's purely instrumental. My, so my, I mean, my, my dissertation, there was like maybe at the beginning, a kernel of it that was kind of like a gen genuine interest, but pretty much like not at all. And as soon as I was done, I was just like happy it was over. I, I had like no interest in it. <laughs> hmm. And how about now? Like what, what are some of the big questions that you're grappling with today? Oh, now, well now, yeah, now I'm in like skinny Dugan because I'm just, it, I'm doing on a daily basis exactly what I'm interested in and nothing else. So the major questions intellectually, Mm -hmm. I would say there's a few. The one kind of research agenda I've been on for a while is understanding what I call the psychology of left authoritarianism. That's kind of how I'm how I'm describing it now. Other people call it you know, like woke and cancel culture. Everyone knows what I'm talking about when I when I say that. I think about it as left authoritarianism. I've done some research on this, so I have I have some data and theory for what's going on here. I have a pretty good personal kind of model, I think, of of what's going on that's different from what other people think. So yeah, that's, that's been an ongoing project. I've written a lot about that and I have a bunch of kind of data analyses and stuff like that hiding on my hard drive that will hopefully become a book sooner than later. Um, that, that would be one thing. Another what, thing. What is oh, that? Thing? Can we double click on that? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. So my theory essentially, well, one of the major insights that I've discovered, which has not percolated up into all the discourses on this yet, um, is that the woke stuff that everyone is so kind of upset about and so kind of obviously stupid and, and scandalous. And it's one of the, you know, like hot topics of the, of the moment, all the crazy, stupid woke stuff is people talk about it as if that represents extreme leftism or radical leftism. And so the mental model, and you hear this everywhere, like the, the Joe Rogans and the Eric Weinsteins and the Jordan Petersons, all pretty much all the people out there who are, you know, diagnosing the woke pathology, they all talk about it implicitly as if what is wrong with it is that those people are too far left. They've gone off the deep end of the extreme left. They're the radical left. And actually that is not the case. As mm -hmm. far as I can tell, that is not the case. They're actually only slightly left and, but they're high on some sort of authoritarian dimension. And it's a crucial, crucial distinction because the fact of the matter is that the really far left people who, in other words, who will answer survey questions by identifying as maximum left wing, essentially, those people who put themselves to the maximum far end of left wing, 
those people are more likely to support free speech than anyone else on the ideological spectrum. So it's simply to equate the wokeness with radical left or extreme left is simply wrong. And yet everyone is still doing it. I've, I've done some analyses. You can find my blog posts that, that have some data to this effect, but it hasn't really, um, it hasn't percolated. It hasn't really, people don't understand the implications of that because once you take that, once you understand that it actually, uh, it, 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 for it's, to, it's a game changer for how you actually think about what's going on with, with the woke stuff. Um, and especially how you think about ideology and ideological placement and stuff like that. And so, um, now that that idea has not really like had like it hasn't really filtered through into the discourse yet the i that's going to be the point of the book essentially is to draw out all of the implications and show how that leads to a totally a, a totally different model of, of of ideology um ideology itself honestly is something that i'm 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 increasingly interested in like people don't i i find increasingly that ideology is such a hot topic right the alt right the alt left that these sorts of debates are so hot but most people don't really even know what ideology is or there are different ways of understanding ideology that um, as a political scientist, I, I, I think I have a kind of unique traction on um, that. I want to, I want to focus more on bringing that to the, to the, to bear. Yeah. What is, what is ideology? Right. So there, I, the way I think about this, I have a piece coming up that'll put this all down on paper, but there are pretty much four different ways that one can think about ideology or four different uh, ways in which this term is invoked. And people use those, people use these differently. Um, and so as a political scientist, I'll start with the first one. As a political scientist, and to me, this is kind of the most scientific, objective, and kind of rational, educated way to think about ideology. Ideology is a latent trait or a statistical construct, essentially, that emerges from survey data on what people think. So there is no essence to what left-wing means or what right-wing means. There's no essence. There, there is only, Colin, I ask you, a hundred questions about different policies you support or don't support. And I ask a few thousand other people, a hundred questions about what people support and what they don't support. And from, from that data set, let's say like 10,000 people each answering a hundred questions, you get this data set, right? And you use statistical techniques to essentially extract what are the major dimensions of variation. And by dimensions of variation, I mean, can you reduce these hundred questions down to one or two or three questions that best summarize all of the other variation? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you find time and time again, over time and place, that generally two dimensions emerge. And those two dimensions map roughly onto what most people have in their minds as left versus right. But that's just, a, it's just a statistical outcome. There's mm -hmm. no essence to it. And how the individual questions load onto the left versus right, that can change over time. Mm. And it does change over time. There's plenty of research on this, right? So in, you know, in one time period, perhaps, you know, gun rights loads on the right wing dimension, but in another time and place, the gun rights can load on to the left wing dimension, just to give you kind of one example, right? Think about the Black Panthers and the, the weather underground back in, back in the day, they, uh, they used guns. The Black Panthers were, were very pro-gun. They, they, were, they were essentially defending their Second Amendment rights, just to give mm -hmm. you one kind of funny example. And so left and right, really, in the most sophisticated way to think about it is that it's just a statistical emergence of a, a, a data set of opinions, essentially. And so that's one way to think about it. There is another way to think about it, which is also kind of valid and 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 use can be useful, but it's different. And I think the failure to recognize these differences is what leads to so much chaos in the discourse. The other way to, th the second best way to think about it, I, I would say is as personality dispositions, essentially. So there, you can have kind of l character traits that lean you towards left-wing preferences, and you can have character traits that lean you towards right-wing preferences. So for me, for instance, I'm very high on openness, so I'm pretty cool with like people being gay or trans or queer. Like I, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, I'm also not really uh, personally bothered by immigration. Like the thought of America having lots of Mexican people and different people from different countries, like that doesn't upset me on a personality level. Like I don't feel any kind of emotional negative trigger when I think about 
Mexicans coming over the border. I just don't feel it because I'm high on openness. That that so that's a kind of physiological mm. uh, aspect to ideology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, also, when I see like queer people in the street, it doesn't like trigger disgust in me. Um, so these things make me a kind of left leaning person. These are traits which increase the probability that I will manifest in the public sphere as as a left wing person. On the other hand, I I'm Catholic and I have a strong kind of taste bud, if you will, a constitutional kind of predilection for, for honesty, for instance, and, and, and truth and order to some degree, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, in the rectification, the rectification of names, right. I want, I want words and things to be properly aligned. I have a, I have a strong taste for that. Right. Um, those, those sorts of things will make me, those are traits that predispose me to manifest in public discourse and debate as a conservative. Um, and so when what I find in the discourse is that people will sometimes be talking about ideology as a statistical construct, as I said in the first model, and then they'll sometimes be talking about it as a personality construct, as, as essentially a kind of um, personal uh, physiological tendency. And, um, the right. So when those, when, to, when people are using one or the other and they're trying to talk about it, it just makes no freaking sense. Uh, the third one, which I think is like, now we're talking about the ones that I think are really dumb and bad, but, but common ways of thinking about ideology. And I mean, you can think about them this way. Uh, there's no saying you can, but I think, I just think they're dumb and, and counterproductive is one is thinking about it as essentially group membership, it's like team membership. And I would say like on the woke in the woke culture, that's probably one of the more dominant ways of thinking about it. And so it's like, it, your ideology is what team are you on? So like, if you're willing to talk with Nick Land, who is termed by someone on the internet as a reactionary, therefore you must be on the team of the reactionaries. Therefore your ideology is reactionary. Therefore, yeah, you're a reactionary. Um, that's just a totally asinine way to think about ideology, which doesn't actually work in the long run, simply because, especially in social network societies, we're all one degree of separation from people with any number of different ideas, right? So um, even if you, no matter how pure you want to be, um, you're going to have some degree of, of, of connection and kind of network proximity to someone that you don't fully agree with. So um, that's, I think, just a, a kind of delusional, crazed, paranoiac way to think about ideology, because if you think about it like that, then um, you're you're pretty much going to be running around hysterically because, because there's, there's never any way to achieve that kind of uh, purity in, in, in highly networked societies, essentially. Mm. Um, but, but often when people like when people talk about ideology or they try to describe my, someone's ideology, like someone's trying to describe my ideology um, they're they often will call me reactionary because they're using this third, this third kind of understanding or definition of, of, of what ideology is. And uh, there was a fourth, but I haven't, uh, talked about this or written about this very recently. So it's not actually coming to my mind, but I know there's a fourth, I forget my th- full theory. <laughs> mm. So, so, so I- ideology is, that is a useful term in and of itself, but only properly understood. It's not like we should just th- throw out it, it. It's not like it has um, outlived its usefulness. You just think it needs to be understood in a more nuanced way. Well, I think it is still useful in the sense that if you look at the correlation structure of public opinion, there are ideologies. There are there are going to be two dimensions of variation that roughly reflect historical division between left and right. So it's hugely useful analytically. Um, mm-hmm. Like that divide uh, matters and, and it does explain variation. So it's useful. Um, and especially as things become increasingly partisan, you know, political scientists know that partisan polarization is increasing. So more and more of the different debates in society are essentially structured along whether you see yourself as a Democrat or a Republican in the U.S. And so as that increases, again, it's uh, like ideology matters for sure. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's, these are real structures that emerge. I think the main, the main error that, that I, I see frequently, which just confuses and upsets so many people, is trying to place particular individuals on ideological scales uh, from from being an outside observer uh, is just like a very high error process. And so what 
what I have generally been preaching lately is that for independent intellectuals, your own ideology means nothing. Like you should not ever be thinking about your own ideology in an a priori way. Mm. So like, as soon as you have an identity as left or right, like you want, you see yourself on team left or team right, or you want to promote or contribute to the left or right. As soon as you see your, your thinking or your, your public activity at all in that way, by definition, you're deviating from the path of the radical, honest intellectual, mm. because that that's essentially uh, to be a radical, honest intellectual, you have, you have to have no concern for what are essentially, as I said at the beginning, statistical outcomes. So like my thinking is I just say everything I think is true as a hypothesis. Some of them are going to be wrong. Some of my hypotheses are going to be wrong. Some of them are going to have a kind of left-wing flavor. Some of them are going to have a kind of right-wing flavor. But where I pop out on that map of left versus right, I'll figure that out later or someone else can figure that out. I don't care. I, it, it has no intrinsic interest to me. Um, and, pres- and probably most of, the mo- most of the most radical thinkers should be pretty much unplaceable on the left and the right. And uh, I, think that, I think that's true over time, honestly. Hmm. Okay, I'd like to do, um, do some 2020 uh, diagnostic. Um, and we're going we're gonna to do it on the, um, the wired and tired axes. Okay. So, so as you look forward into the future, thinking about what the year 2020 has in store, um, what things, what, what aspects of culture do you think are going to become more wired over time? In the short term, one prediction I have is that I think the specific medium of eBooks by radical intellectuals is going to increase. I think we're at the beginning. I think we're at the beginning of a moment on this. Not, I shouldn't just say eBooks actually. I, I, I take that back, but self-published books because it's just as easy to do your own paperback. Um, and eBooks still kind of feels diminutive to, to our ears. Um, so just basically um, radical independent intellectuals publishing their own books. I think mm-hmm. you're gonna see more and more of that in the next few years. Because I think we're just at the beginning of it. I think people like Bronze Age Pervert really kind of uh, surprised people about how much impact you could have and how, m- how much money you could make also from doing a relatively short, relatively unimpressive, but creative and, and interesting. I'm not trying to throw shade, uh, but there, it's no, there's nothing particularly exceptional or difficult about uh, what BAP achieved in, in his short book. Uh, you know, that like the spelling isn't great. The grammar isn't great. It's short. It's not, you know, it's funny and it's interesting and it's splashy. Um, but my point is a lot of people are looking at that and the success he's had in terms of impact and sales. And they're thinking, oh, I could do that. And they can do that. And more and more people will realize that. And it's becoming more and more worthwhile. Uh, the market for, uh, digital products is increasing, people's comfort buying things on mobile is increasing in part because the technology is improving and the transaction costs, the difficulty of actually purchasing something like a book um, from a random person in your social network, that's becoming easier and easier. So you'll see more and more of it. The younger generations are more and more comfortable with it. And they're also more and more checked out of uh, the traditional uh, markers of prestige. And uh, yeah, I think, I think you're going to see more and more radical intellectuals totally unaffiliated with institutions publishing their own books and having a splash and making impact and making money for themselves. Also, I, I, I'm very bullish on, on, on that larger culture. Obviously I'm in some sense gambling my whole life on that larger trend of this kind of independent intellectual culture continuing to become more and more viable. But if you want something specific, I would say watch out for self-published books in particular. Mm. How about, how about alternative um, styles of, like communal living, wired or tired? I think wired for sure in the sense of I, I like them and, and I, I, I'm interested in them. I think they're, they're a promising path to explore for a lot of people, especially as like the financial situation of a lot of millennials is not really looking too hot. I think it's, it's, it's definitely good and promising and, and something people should look more into. But in terms of predicting whether it will really take off, it's hard to know. I don't, I tend to generally stay away from predictions personally, but I'll, I'm happy to play. I'm happy to play your game. Uh, I don't know. I don't know because the financial situations 
uh, would predict that communal living would become more popular because it's harder and harder for, you know, a lot of people my age aren't able to buy a house yet and stuff like that. So the finances push in the favor of, of this prediction of communal housing becoming more prominent, but the social atomization yeah. I think pushes against it. And the, the, so all the social atomization fragmentation uh, I think is making it harder and harder for people to actually just be with other people. Yeah. And like the, like the nuclear family as an idea is something that we were all sort of born into and it's hard to imagine anything outside of that. And then you, and then you add this, the whole social atomization thing on top of that, it makes it even, yeah, it makes it even more difficult. I mean, I'm kind of doing it now myself. I'm kind of living communally with, with some people in Albuquerque. Um, whoa. And you know what, actually, I mean, it, I, I'm kind of bullish on it also because if you look at like the big time YouTubers and like the social media influencers and stuff like that, a lot of those people live in collective houses. Did you know this? Yeah, I saw you post about that. I'm increasingly kind of interested in this. Like I would, I'm in a way I'm kind of doing a very, very small scale, modest uh, kind of bourgeois highbrow version of that with, <laughs> with Jeffrey Miller and Diana Fleischman, who I'm living with in Albuquerque. Um, in some sense, we are actually kind of doing something like that, but I am I am quite interested actually in, in, in doing something like that more aggressively, like having a big house, um, like a mansion where like a bunch of really internet based, internet focused, uh, creative intellectuals who are educated and doing serious kind of, as I said, highbrow work, um, getting a bunch of people like myself into a house and living, living together, um, is something I'm, I'm actually very personally intrigued by and open-minded uh, about and 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 possibly interested in kind of like the the YouTube kids do in LA essentially I don't think I would I don't think it would look like that exactly mm-hmm. but the logic of pooling resources of being more of, of forcing each other to be to produce more of, of of sharing tips and tricks and and developing a lifestyle around it and and the financial benefits of of pooling resources um, especially when like you know radical intellectuals you know are, have never made much money and they're probably not they sh- shouldn't expect to make much money but communal living has always been a way to um, essentially hack that a bit and, and and do better for yourself financially in terms of costs. Mm. Um, yeah, I like I've I've been basically kind of saying this for some time. I've been saying it frequently. The problem, as always, is just like finding the right people, right? So mm-hmm. I, I consider myself very into that possibility and would be very open minded to to considering it. Um, I just haven't been blessed with finding like the right group of people who are able and willing and keen to do that quite yet. But like if the right group pro- approached me right now, I could, I, I could very well go for something like that. <laughs> Is that something that you are, you're sort of actively courting? Like, do you, do you find yourself sort of like scanning and looking for people that you would actually make an ask? Or are you sort of just w- hoping that a group approaches you? To be honest, in a way I am, I, in a way, I kid you not, Colin, I've kind of been looking for this since I was 18. I mean, mm. this is like the communist side of me. I mean, I've always, I, I, I'm not kidding. It's been a kind of guiding dream in the back of my mind uh, since I came of age that the ideal way to live would be some type of big collective with a bunch of other radical, honest, super creative, educated, hardworking, badass uh creative revolutionaries, essentially. I mean, that's like always what it's all I've ever wanted. And I've tried it a few different times, to be honest. Like it's actually recurred in my life a few times. When I was in Mm -hmm. grad school, I lived in a big warehouse, a big like abandoned meatpacking factory with like a, with like 25 crazy ass people, like really pretty crazy people. Some of whom were very creative and productive. Some of whom were just like, uh, not, um, (laughs) but, um, yeah. So I, like, I did that for a few years. We tried, we, we, it was like pretty wild experiment. That's a whole other podcast. I could tell you the whole story if you wanted, but, um, I was looking for it then. I, 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 in some ways, I'm looking for it now. That's why I'm here living with Jeffrey and Diana. So it's like, mm-hmm. I, I've actually always been on, on. I've always had this kind of, I don't know, motivation or dream of just finding other like badass people and just going all in with them on, um, yeah, overthrowing all currently existing institutions. Like I've always wanted to do that with like a badass group of people. I think it's a kind of an evolved thing also, right? Because I think... Um, from our kind of hunter gatherer history, we do have this kind of uh, evolved preference for tight knit groups 
pursuing some mission against mm -hmm. a kind of harsh, brutal external order, right? I think that's like a very uh, longstanding sort of evolved structure that we have. And I think in some sense, I, what I'm describing is essentially tapping into that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, man. I mean, this is something that I'm really interested in too. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about like what you've done or how you're thinking about that or what's, um, well, there, there are two threads that I am seeing right now. Um, one of them is the, the sort of ecosystem that my podcast has existed in is overlapped with this game B meme. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, it's kind of this nebulous concept, but the, the thing that, um, I think kind of unites people that are interested in it are people that are actively formulating alternative ways of being and living and doing in the world. And so I've had people reach out to me from this podcast who um, basically want me to consult for like, how do we create this regenerative community? And they have like, you know, their own specific setup and um, they want like an outside perspective to come in and just kind of like be a sparring partner for them. Cool. So, so that's that's one thread is like mm. is imagining like what my ideal regenerative community would look like. Right. And um, I'm also based in Denver and have got I, I've started apprenticing with a medicine woman who does guided psilocybin mushroom journeys. Nice. And uh, so that's like that's part of my work, too. And I'm going to start taking on my own clients this year. And. Um, there's something really interesting about using psychedelics in a context, like, like when you were talking about this, this idea of a group of intellectuals living in a house who are all sort of supporting each other in some way, just by their energy of being there and support and, and aligning themselves to, uh, you know, their individual intellectual vision, imagining what it would be like to create some sort of collective coherence in like a psychedelic context. So like, what would it look like if everyone comes together, everyone's like working on their own problems. Maybe they have an obstacle with their upcoming career and okay. they sort of are able to tap into this group mind and people can help each other out. And in that sort of psychedelic space, you could even do this with microdosing. You know, amazing insights can come from that. Just like shifting perspective just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So... Those are the two threads that I think are going to be overlapping in a more uh, intentional way this year. Cool. Yeah, those, those are promising leads. I definitely like to hear about how that works out for you. My When I think about my ideal vision personally, what it looks like more and more is, because I have to admit, I do really like my privacy and I, I do kind of, I, I like very long periods of like not interacting with people. I actually yeah. don't, I don't like interact with many people at all other than my wife and Jeffrey and Diana when they're home. And then the internet, I actually, I inter actually interact with more people on the internet by far probably mm -hmm. than in real life. Um, so I do like very long periods of, of alone time essentially. And so my ideal model would be instead of like sharing a mansion in LA, which is super expensive and, and a bit claustrophobic for me personally, I would rather have my own house, like a modest house, maybe like a little fixer upper or whatever, somewhere somewhat rural. I think personally, I kind of, I'm into like the mountains and forest vibe personally, mm -hmm. but on a huge plot of land, like, yeah. like, a hundred acres where you could yeah. have other people could have their own houses also. So like in my ideal vision, there'd be like a hundred acres, maybe like in the Western Carolinas in the Appalachian, you know, like on the Blue Ridge mountains or something like that, like a hundred acres. And there'd be like 10 badass, really productive, creative, totally internet based, totally unaffiliated with any currently existing institutions, just like 10 different, individuals with their own household living in their own house, but on shared property. And we all have basically like ATVs and dirt bikes and probably g guns and stuff like, like cool stuff like that. Fun, fun stuff to kind of like yeah. play with, play with and, and fuck around with. And we'd all just be doing our own independent long-term trajectories, our own independent research and our own personal projects uh, with a long time horizon. But in between that, just for fun, for stimulation, for creativity, there would just be a bunch of other collaborations. Obviously, everyone could like podcast, everyone could do, there could be shared video studio resources or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pooling some of those resources, but having plenty of time and space for, for quiet alone time also, that I think would be like the dream model for my type of intellectual going full-time on the internet. 
Yeah. And you could even, you could even, if you're interested in travel, you could even build in a component where you um, get a group of the more sort of outgoing extroverted people on the compound to start a consulting business. Like other, if there are other people that are interested in this model, like you literally get flown to other places to present on like what it is you're doing. Hell yeah, I would do that. I mean, honestly, I actually do have a lot of experience with kind of community design and uh, household collaborative household living experiences. Like I could write a whole book on the three years that I lived in the the crazy meatpacking plant um, because that was just like uh, really, really bonkers. And I learned a lot. We, we tried so many different things and it was pretty like radical, ambitious uh, project uh, with, with a lot of trial and error. And uh, yeah, so if, especially if you could if you could create something like this and pull it off, then yeah, people would want you to consult like crazy. Like, oh, teach us how to do this. Uh, yeah, for sure. Damn, dude. Okay, I want to be sensitive to your time. You need to go soon. Um, but if maybe if there's any, la- are there any last things, any last thoughts that you you want to talk about before we go? I'm trying to think. What time did I say I have to go? Let me check my, I, I, think I have something two- coming up right now, but I forget already. I think you said 2.30. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. As long as we're off by, by two 30 or maybe a few minutes after that's, that's fine. So um, anything I want to talk about, I guess I'd maybe like to learn more about you. I, mean, I, I fear now that I think mm. about it, maybe I, I did too much talking and not enough question asking. No, that's Sorry, okay, man. That's rambling. all good. Um, Yeah. Tell me more about like, what are you up to in Denver? Mm. I, I, I remember you did tell me already some, but um, at the current moment, like how would you describe your, your main, your main thing that you're focusing on? My main thing right now is, um, uh, I was contracted to help design this leadership development program. So this guy, this guy found me through my podcast who he's like this big sort of executive leadership coach who works with executives of like fortune 500 companies and stuff. And um, we got to talking, he, he liked some of these episodes of my podcast and, and we just started uh, corresponding back and forth. And so I'm doing some curriculum design for this program. So the the basic the basic demographic is going to be people that are at the like late stage of their career. They are successful by society's metrics. They they hit all the boxes. Mm. Um, but we live in a culture that is devoid of rites of passage into elderhood. We don't have a space. Mm. We don't have a space for elders at all because uh, mm. we're we're fucking terrified of death. Mm. Um, and so the idea with this program is to design this rite of passage with some, um, there's psychedelics will be involved in some other things, um, for basically helping people move into a liminal space outside of their, um, their successful life that they live and imagine a more meaningful existence. Like what, what project do they want to take on if they really survey themselves and their lives, all the context that they're in what would a meaningful existence as an elder look like in mm. our culture? So I'm, do, I'm basically doing curriculum design for this, this program. Nice. nice. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. And then this, this podcast and then um, yeah, it, some work with psychedelic stuff as well. That's cool. I have a colleague, a fellow indie thinker who does some consulting work on end of life care. Oh, cool. His name is Johannes. He's a Heideggerian. Um, he's, he's done my podcast a couple of times. And we have some collaborations going on. Uh, he, yeah, he, he's done work for the NHS on uh, end of life care from like a Heideggerian perspective. It's pretty oh, dude, interesting. I want to yeah. read, what's his name? I want to yeah, he'd guy. be open to talking with you for sure. Uh, his name is Johannes Niederhauser. Okay. You can find him on my stuff probably if you can. I'm sure you can find him if you just Google the name, but uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's cool, dude. You might have some things to, he, he's another person kind of like me trying to carve out a, a kind of a online career like, like me a bit. He's got some other things going on too, but uh, yeah, I think how, where, where, where's your audience come from? Like wh- how would you summarize the, the <clears throat> demographic center of your audience? Like where do they, how do they find you and who are, what type of people? Um, most of the people find me through Twitter and most of them are like in my age demographic. I mean, okay. most of them, yeah, it's like, mostly males, but there's some females. Um, but mm. it, but it seems to be like millennial men. Yeah. And are you religious? Um, I'm not religious, but I have a, I have a spiritual practice. Gotcha. Cause the Zion definitely sounds religious. Yeah. Well, so I was born, I was born Mormon. 
So, That's right. You did tell me that. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so one of the, one of the images on here is, is the angel Moroni who's he's like the, the figure of the, the figurehead for the Mormon church, like the symbol represent it. So I wanted to put it in there growing out of psychedelic mushrooms, just cause it felt like interesting and, and like, it just kind of like a nod to my Mormon roots. And, and then this other symbol, this is like the Zen, the Zen circle, the sort of symbol of life and death, just a reminder of the, the cycles of life. Right on. Do you have a big network in Denver? Um, uh, I have a growing network in Denver. I'm pretty new here. I, I just moved here in September. Um, Are there a lot of cool people? Yeah. I, w- I mean, I was in Salt Lake City before and okay. Salt Lake is a, it's a weird town. Yeah. Um, Denver's a little bit more my, I think a little bit okay. more my pace. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. What, what's, what's Albuquerque like and what are you doing there? It's pretty cool. Um, I'm, well, I'm here pretty much just because Jeffrey and Diana invited us. To oh, be cool. Here. I mean, it was a, it was a kind of confluence of our different interests because they knew that I was leaving academia and moving back to the States. And so they knew that my future was totally up for grabs. And, uh, on their end here, I think Jeffrey's a professor at, at the university of New Mexico. And, mm. uh, I think they, they, they don't love Albuquerque <laughs> exactly. I think they're kind of, uh, somewhat bored here and don't have as much kind of like intellectual and social stimulation as they might like. So I, they were kind of like, Hey, why don't you just come live with us? Cheap rent. We have a big house. And, uh, cool. and so we were like, yeah, we have no other plans. So it sounds good. Let's do it. Nice. Yeah. And I'm like, right now I'm in this little, I'm in the basement where, um, we basically have built up a little, a little studio. We have all this like video equipment and podcasting equipment. Cool. And, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done anything to, it's funny. We have this table where like Jeffrey and Diana, their side is the other side. So their background, they have a background that's like their style or whatever. And with mine, like, I've never really been much for like aesthetics personally. I, I, I will get, I do want to get around to it. I, I, I want that the next place that I live when I settle somewhere more permanently, um, I want to have like a nice proper kind of live stream podcast room. That's like cool and, mm-hmm. and everything. But uh, until now, my, my aesthetic has just been like the lo-fi haphazard DIY aesthetic. Yeah. Well, that's an aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a choice it's, for sure. It's the, it's the authentic one too. It's just like, it is kind of just, it is yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I bought this um, this backdrop. This is like eighty bucks. Um, I bought it for a, I threw a launch party for this podcast like back in yeah. March, and uh, had it as a photo backdrop. And it's it was a good investment. I'm glad I got it. That's cool. Did you? Um, yeah, no, th- for sure. I like it. Did, did you? Did you do the the party in Denver? No, I was in Salt Lake at the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm looking to do. I'm going to do a book launch party. I think I'm like planning that right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, the base to lose paperback is going to be out like soon. I actually have the author proof all done. It's on. It's 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 in the mail on its way to me. So if it all looks good, uh, the paperback will be out soon. And uh, so I think for that, I want to. Yeah, I want to do some sort of big event. Maybe do well, like a. Let's brainstorm. What do you What do you want? Well, I'm I'm <laughs> honestly looking. I'm thinking about doing it in L.A. I think I'm going to make a visit to L.A. Um, just because I have never been there, and it's like the the flight from Albuquerque to LA is like 120 bucks round trip. So, hmm. uh, and I know a bunch of people out there who are cool and who I just would like to meet. So I've had on my list of things to do for a long time to get out to LA and see some people. And so I'm kind of thinking I might make my first experiment in the land of like having an event, like a real event. I've done some meetups. I actually did like a short like tour when I was going from England to Albuquerque. I stopped in a few places and met up with people. I did some meetups Mm -hmm. and the turnout was actually consistently good. And it was really cool people. And, uh, some of those people, after I hosted the meetup, some of those people became close friends and have their own groups now that are persisting over time. So I was actually very pleased by just how fun it was, how, how, and how effective it seemed to be in actually producing positive collaborative results and, and new developments. So I, I, yeah, I've dabbled a little bit in hosting events and, and creating that type of IRL type of experiment, but it was never very, it was always very simple, quick, not at all sophisticated or planned out big thing. So with my little successes under my belt in that regard, I think I'm going to take a stab. I'm not committed to this yet, but I'm close to possibly committing to this. I think I'm going to take a stab at organizing and hosting a somewhat more major event uh, in LA, maybe I think is what I'm looking at. Cool. I tweeted the other night. I tweeted the other night, this like harebrained idea. This is basically how I work. Like I, I tweet random ideas and the ones that get a lot of traction. I like think seriously about doing, mm-hmm. uh, I tweeted this harebrained idea of having a, having a book launch party in LA 
Um, or maybe even like a retreat type thing, like where mm -hmm. I get like a massive Airbnb and a bunch of people from the internet can share the cost with me and come live with me for three days. Uh, something like that. I'm still, I'm still figuring out the parameters, but if anyone out there has input or whatever, I'm very open right now. And I actually, over the next few days, I have some Skype calls with people in based in LA and stuff like that. So I'm going to be thinking about the parameters, but I do want to do something that is like a little bit more ambitious. I want to try this like new, this world of, of like actually having badass events, uh, maybe do like a live, a live podcast kind of show type thing. I would really like to, I think that'd be really fun. Yeah, I would enjoy it. that. So I, I haven't decided my, what exactly, but I, um, yeah. I did that with my launch party. It was so fun. It was so fun to have a live audience. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it sounds really fun and it'd be cool. And I think people would enjoy it. And it seems like whenever I have events when I have meetups, people make interesting new friendships that they, you know, are looking for. So I, I feel like that it, it, it feels like it would be worthwhile to, to put in the work to do it. Um, so yeah, I'm not fully committed cause I'm, I'm a little daunted by it. And especially doing it in a city I don't, I don't live in feels kind of strange, but there's just so many more people out there and it's not that far from here. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. If you can find two, if you can find like at, at least one, uh, person who would be willing to do some, share some of the organizing load who's on site in LA, that'd probably help a lot. True. True. Yeah. So, well, but I'm, I'm open to other things, dude. We could do, we could do an event in Denver, man. If you wanted to like what I, cause what I could do honestly is um, I could do a little book tour if people, if that was something that people were interested in doing. So like I have enough friends in different places, I could just go to a few different cities. And uh, if someone, like, if you wanted to help me organize a talk, we could have a party in Denver. I could give it, I could give a talk. Maybe you give a talk. Someone else gives a talk. We can do whatever. The sky's the limit. Super get, get, down whatever. for that. So Jared James from the both and podcast. He's in Denver too. Oh, right on. So we could do, we could maybe do like a, like a three-way podcast hosted event or something like that. That'd, That'd be dope. Cool. Yeah. I'd do that. Anything, any last words from you, man? I don't think so, man. I'm, I, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you, you making, uh, making the time and coming out. Definitely. Glad you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope I was able to give your audience something interesting or valuable at some point in all of that. Yeah, it was awesome, man. Keep up the good work and um, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on, Colin. We'll, we'll be right. in touch for sure. Okay. Keep me posted on your, on your projects. All right, later, buddy. Bye.